Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is uh, Douglas van der Berg. I'm the CEO of Investment Consulting Associates, um, a management advisory firm. Uh, welcome to this interesting session that actually covers the central theme of, uh, of the conference, which is about competitiveness and how competitiveness, what are the roots of competitiveness, how can it be improved, and what is the future of competitiveness, and how do we measure it? We have a very um, distinguished panel of experts talking from different perspectives about how they see um, competitiveness is evolving of countries or regions or even free zones and how they can play a role in enhancing the competitive position of countries. Um, I would like to get started because this session is not about me. I'm moderating the session. Um, but I would like to, to get started with you know, the, the panelists and, and ask questions straight away. So um, I would like to uh, briefly introduce everyone and then we'll start with the, um, the first question. On my left we have uh, Mr. Uh, Ardu Ermut, he's the president of WIPA, the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. He's going to be addressing the question on competitiveness from his perspective, his view from the investment promotion agencies around the world that his organization represents. Next to him is uh, Mr. Fahad Altafak. He's the director of economic affairs and international cooperation of the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Uh, obviously, um, be representing the UAE in many diplomatic and trade missions and investment missions, he will also share his insights from what he sees as uh, good elements and good components of a competitive business environment. Next to him is uh, Mr. Jorge Ramos de Oliveira, Jr. He's the president of Embraer. Uh, he's based in the Netherlands. He's one of our corporate representatives in this panel. So he will be addressing how he and his organization, his company, sees competitiveness. Um, next to him is Dr. Um, Samir Hamruni. He's the CEO of the World Free Zones Organization based here in Dubai. The World Free Zones Organization is a network organization for free zones around the world. And obviously, um, Dr. Samir will, will be able to provide guiding questions and uh, guiding answers from what he sees and his organization sees as what role free zones can play in improving a competitive business environment. Next to him is Mr. Sigfrido Reyes. He's the president of Export and Investment Promotion Agency of El Salvador. Uh, we just had a nice conversation. They just had a big event in El Salvador. El Salvador is one of the um, successful countries in Central America that has actually increased its competitive position over the last couple of years among some of the major business rankings. So he'll be addressing um, the competitiveness questions from his perspective as a um, CEO of the um, Export and Investment Promotion Agency of El Salvador. The last one that I would like to introduce is uh, Professor Dr. Xavier <coughs> Javier Sala E. Martin. I think many of you know him, uh, apart from the fact that he used to be the president of SA Barcelona. He is now one of the founding fathers of the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Yearbook. So he's actually the one that develops uh, the competitiveness rankings on behalf of the World Economic Forum. And I would like to give the first question actually um, to him in terms of um, what he sees as what role governments can actually and other stakeholders play in um, enhancing the competitive business environment of their countries. Okay, thank you. Um... I think, I think the, the, key, the key word of the question is the stakeholders, uh, meaning that uh, competitiveness is not about what the government can do or what the government should do. Uh, governments play their role, but companies play their role, uh, educators play their role, workers play their role, uh, and therefore there is, uh, there is uh, many players, uh, many players that, uh, that are, uh, um, involved in the process of, uh, of uh, uh, creating a competitive society. 
Um, I'm not going to go through uh, all the list of things that we usually measure at the World Economic Forum, the institution, the finance, the uh, regulation, blah, 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 blah. Let me focus on the three points, three areas that uh, we are going to focus, uh, this is the 10th year anniversary of the co uh, Global Competitiveness Index, uh, therefore we are revamping it, we are changing it uh, in light of what we see uh, is going on in the world, especially with the uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, the, let me talk about the three, three key areas where we need to focus. First, uh, innovation. innovation uh, is not research and development. Innovation is not about R&D. We should not identify innovation with R&D. Uh, there, there is innovation in all, there should be innovation in all areas, in all companies, no matter what sector. Uh, um, um, Zara is innovation, Cirque du Soleil is innovation, uh, IKEA was innovation at the time. Those are the kinds of uh, ideas that, uh, that uh, we should be thinking of. Um, and therefore, we need to think about uh, uh, the, the creative part of uh, innovation. But uh, innovation, as uh, Schumpeter highlighted, also has another side of the coin, which is destruction, creative destruction. And with these uh, come two problems. Number one, the ludits. Right? There are people who obviously make a lot of money from the old world, the old ideas, the ideas that are being destroyed, uh, the taxi drivers in a, in a world where Uber is being introduced, uh, that will oppose. They will oppose uh, competitiveness, they will oppose uh, technological progress, they will oppose change, and that we need to deal with. And if we don't deal with this, you, will, uh, you might end up with populist movements as we have seen in uh, some areas uh, of the world. Um, also, Sometimes the worst enemy of innovation, and that's a, a, an important lesson for uh, corporations, is the corporation itself, right? Uh, uh, Kodak uh, used to be the uh, leading company, uh, you know, they, they, they produced materials to, uh, to, uh, for, to, for uh, taking uh, hundreds of millions, uh, billions of pictures every year. Now they are bankrupt. And they're bankrupt, obviously, because there is a new technology, uh, which is uh, digital photography. Uh, um, who invented digital photography? The answer is Kodak. They invented the technology that eventually uh, killed them. Uh, the problem is that they invented them, but they didn't implement them. Same thing with Nokia. Nokia had all the elements to create the new the smartphone, but they didn't. And the reason that, that these companies did not innovate, even though they had the ideas, even though they had the technology, was that there was a big enemy to innovation, and that's called core business. When you protect core business and the world changes, you are bound to die, okay? So sometimes the worst enemy of innovation is the company that innovates. The second area where we think we need to, uh, we need to uh, um, think hard uh, in the future is education. The world is changing rapidly. 50% of the jobs will disappear uh, in the next uh, couple of decades. Uh, the jobs as we know it, uh, we need to rethink how we educate our children. The children, will not gonna, the children born today are not gonna live in the world where we, uh, where we live and they should not get the education that we receive. Uh, which brings me to the third point uh, and that is inclusion. In all process of technological progress, in all process of uh, trade, in all process of all processes uh, that involve change, uh, there are winners and there are losers. Okay, uh, we economists have proven, have shown again and again that trade overall is good, technological progress overall is good, which means that the gains for the winners are larger than the losses for the losers. But we should not forget that there are losers. And if we don't take care of the losers, they're gonna end up voting for Donald Trump. They're gonna end up voting for Le Pen. They're gonna end up voting for populist movements that might end up killing the whole exercise. And therefore, in, for the sake of progress, we should make sure that we not only think about uh, competitiveness, but we should think about inclusive competitiveness. And I'm gonna leave it here for now.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabier. Um, I would like to, to ask um, Mr. Jorge Ramos de Oliveira also, he represents Embraer, a global company. Um, from his perspective, what as a company does he see as important components of a competitive business environment? Well, when, when you mean to be competitive, you mean to add value in differently. So you make your differentiation, adding more value than the others in the, in the chain, value chain that you are part of. And this is also for the, the government side. It's more or less the same. So you need to focus on that. Of course, investing in innovation is very important. Investing in increasing the efficiency is really very important. And in the last decades, we have seen a, a moving to not just the company investing in their own um, efficiency, but also focusing in the, the efficiency of the cluster, complete cluster, because this is important. It's not enough for you to innovate and to get efficiency by yourself, just yourself. You need for the whole um, supply chain. So I believe that one of the most important things is the partnership. Partnership with the government and partnership with the other companies in the supply chain in the cluster. Because with these partnerships, you, you can really uh, be able to, to do all the investments you need. So this is one, one point that I think is really important. And the second one is Strategy, long-term strategy. You need to, to have a, a strategy and have a, a strategic plan that is robust for many different futures that you, you may face. So you need to be flexible, you need to be diligent, and to make your changes and to focus your innovation in the direction that you be more resilient to to any crisis that may appear. And this is also from the government side. That's why we understand it's really important for the government to be flexible and to innovate also in, in the areas of uh, policies, regulations, also education. So you need to have a very well prepared environment to do that. That's why we need this partnership so together with the cluster, we can identify all the requirements, all the needs that will bring a good environment for investment for that sector. And with the partnership with the government, we can work together in order to achieve that. So I believe this is the most important thing for competitiveness. Thank you. Um, Dr. Samir, um, your organization has many members um, and represents a, uh, a large number of, uh, of free zones. Um, how can free zones increase the, uh, the competitiveness of, of countries or regions or, or cities? Um, what is your experience? Thank you, Douglas. Assalamu alaikum. Um, allow me first of all to start uh, by a definition what we understand by a free zone. <clears throat> a free zone is a closed space in which you have customs exemption or suspension, and on the top of it, you add incentives to attract investors. With this definition, we can include free zone, <coughs> export processing zone, free trade zone, special economic zones, and uh, According to the World Bank, today we have 4,000 free zones in more than 130 countries. We contribute to the third of the global trade. We host more than 2 million companies and we employ 70 million persons, which is the third of the global, uh, global workforce. So, and this is as an introduction. Uh, 
If you take the World Bank report of doing business or even Xavier uh, report on competitiveness and you apply it at zones level, not at country level, you will see that zones in each one and all the countries are always having a higher ranking than the national average. And uh, we reached that, in my opinion, we have a free zone since 52 or 3 when Shannon, Ireland, launched their first free zone. And we reached that, in my opinion, th through three major elements. First of all, we created an excellent business environment. We were the first to start with the one-stop shop. Today, we have the online one-stop shop. And as an example, today in Dubai Airport Free Zone, you can create a company through your smartphone. So the business environment, the tech-ready zones, was one of the major elements of our contribution to the competitiveness. The second is the long-term commitment. In each one of the countries, in each one of the zones, the commitment with investors, starting from the day he invests and taking care of it after, is 25, 30 years commitment. And this is extremely important to improve competitiveness and to attract investors. And the third element, I will not uh, perhaps be speaking a lot on it, it is like my colleague Xavier said, innovation. We are extremely innovative at zones. We innovate in our services, we innovate in our rules, our regulation, and more than this, today at zones we anticipate some somehow government policy or somehow critical situation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Samir. Um, Mr. Arda, um, as president of WIPA, you uh, represent many investment promotion agencies. What, what role do investment promotion agencies, IPAs, play in shaping a competitive business environment? You're obviously, IPAs are usually the first point of contact for many companies that invest in, in countries. So f you know, from your view and, and the organizations that you, uh, that you represent, what, what thoughts can you share with us on, on the role they play in enhancing a, the competitiveness of countries? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm, uh, as you put it very correctly, I'm the chairman of WIPA. Now, WIPA is an institution, an umbrella institution, represents 170 investment promotion agencies, either local or national, from more than 130 countries. So we can say that it's a good medium for benchmarking, actually. And at the same time, I'm the president of the investment agency of Turkey, too. So when I'm talking about uh, the investment, uh, the FDI perspective of these issues, I'm also will be, uh, you know, the, uh, somehow uh, getting some examples from Turkish experience, too. First of all, I can say that uh, investment promotion agencies, uh, first and foremost, of, of course, contribution is definitely making the game uh, situation uh, e equal for the foreigners and the locals. I think it's very important for competition because if you look at the eras of pot protectionism uh, in that times, usually for supporting the infant sector uh, industries in the local countries, the governments may take some protectionist measures, but uh, when it comes to when you make an open policy, uh, open door policy for the foreign direct investments is totally the opposite. And so far, either from the Turkish experience and from the experience of the developing countries in general, we can see that the more uh, open policy you follow, pursue for your industries, you can see that it easily becoming integrated to global situation and becoming more and more competitive. From Turkish case, I can easily give the example of automotive sector. Uh, for years and years until 90s, we have been waiting for on the queue for the you know the for very low standard quality cars in Turkey, which was either an assembly or a product in Turkey with some license of some global brands. But after Turkish market opened to some global you know the competition, then and together with the customs union, which means that uh, Turkish producers started to uh, you know they compete very actively 
with the Euro uh, European uh, producers for the European and the other markets suddenly became an interesting point. And now Turkish automotive sector is number one in its exports, the country's exports, and the main export partner is Europe itself. And uh, number one is Germany, number two is UK. So it's an interesting case, but it's obvious that you know, the innovation and uh, you know, the creativity and uh, together with uh, adding value to your local sectors, these, this is a virtuous circle feeding each other. The more value you add, uh, the more creativity you add and innovation you add at the end. And uh, these two others uh, definitely supporting each other. And uh, investment promotion agencies making it easier for foreign companies to fill the missing points in the supply chains of the critical sectors, actually making it much easier for local suppliers especially. I mean, the, especially the SME and upper SME level companies and making it more easier for them by filling these gaps in the supply chains because they are decreasing the costs, providing know-how, and uh, opening up some new market poss possibilities for the local suppliers. Usually for Turkish case, for example, also for ma majority of the Europe also, we are talking about second and third generation family-owned businesses, which are very successful in their business maybe, but doesn't have a, they don't have a global vision, or in their balance sheet, in their management, they are not very professional. But with some also mergers and acquisitions with, uh, through uh, foreign companies, it is becoming much easier for them to uh, infiltrate to global markets too. So this is another contribution that's being done through investment promotion agencies. I think is more or less when we talk about the contribution of FDI or IPAs together, we can talk about a, a kind of a mutual relationship, but at the end, uh, making the environment more competitive, making it easier for foreign companies to be active in the local business, I think uh, they are somehow contributing very, in a very important extent to the competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Arda. Um, Mr. Fahad, you, uh, you represent the, uh, the UAE in many high-level meetings with many diplomats and economic decision makers um, across this region, but also worldwide. Um, what is your view on the role of competitiveness in promoting international trade and investment, uh, especially you know, looking at the current political and economic landscape? Thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, I'm uh, very much privileged to be uh, among the distinguished uh, guests with us this uh, afternoon. Uh, when looking at competitiveness, I think it's a set of ins institutions, policies, and factors that determine the level of economic uh, productivity, and it's a key driver for FDI attraction. Uh, when looking at uh, the empirical and academic evidence, evidences, uh, they prove that overriding competitiveness uh, to depend only on uh, conventional economic stimulus such as uh, fiscal and monetary incentives is not sufficient. Uh, in fact, in, since 2008, uh, conventional stimulus methodolo methodologies for the economy has uh, uh, proven otherwise. They were constrained by high fiscal burdens. They were also constrained by zero interest rates, making structural competitiveness reforms and unique solution for economic and FDI stagnation a necessity. In fact, there are some other uh, schools of thought that think about uh, uh, competitiveness as a lesser influential on, on, on economic growth. However, my argument today is that a competitiveness from a government perspective would mean providing streamlined services, providing the right infrastructure, the right legal uh, framework, uh, in addition to making sure that the investor has the confidence to invest in, in, in its economy has the incentives that are required to uh, become more confident in, in, in the return, to become more confident in the repatriation, and also to, come, to become more confident in securing uh, future growth for, for their businesses. When looking also at competitiveness from, uh, from a different perspective, uh, I, think, I think competitiveness is, is, uh, is uh, at the core of economic diplomacy. I come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I'm in charge of the economic and trade uh, affairs within the ministry. And I think it sits at the core of the, of the economic diplomacy that is spearheaded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Relations. Uh, 
the UAE has made significant steps in that in that regard since uh, uh, its UAE Vision 2021 discusses with with great uh, weight uh, put on competitiveness, uh, especially that we are currently uh, ranked uh, the first in the Middle East and North uh, Africa in the ease of doing business. However, uh, we are 26 in, in the uh, overall uh, ranking, and the target is to become uh, the, among the top 10 in the Global Competitiveness Index uh, by 2021. I fully, I fully acknowledge the valuable uh, role of competitiveness in spurring investments and economic growth, and my argument is just an illustration, and uh, it also addresses the important complementary role of economic diplomacy in building competitiveness and also reapping the benefits of economic competency, co competency. The UAE economic diplomacy has been playing a vital role in, improve, in improving economic competitive, competitiveness by providing effective platforms. Uh, the government has made significant steps uh, towards uh, providing innovative solutions to the investors to have more confidence to invest in, in, in the country through different uh, 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 mechanisms, of course. Uh, there has been also many successes of economic diplomacy in hosting IRENA, for example. We currently have in the UAE the lowest solar electricity tariff in the globe. Uh, we also uh, in the UAE have contributed to competitiveness. We built on it and gained the best of it. I think uh, I would like to leave you with two, uh, I would say, uh, recommendations. The first one is to uh, invite the policy makers to look at the competitiveness and the competitive amplifiers and enablers, including economic diplomacy in their structural reform and in, their, in, in looking at the uh, current political and economic landscapes. Many countries have had uh, uh, great initiatives bringing together nations. Uh, we've seen this in Asia, we've seen this in, in, in Europe, and we've seen it also in Africa and many other continents. The second recommendation would be urging analysts and academia to explore more uh, the multidimensional uh, relationship between competitiveness, economic diplomacy, and the foreign direct investment. Uh, this will certainly add to the uh, body of knowledge uh, by interpreting part of the competitiveness shortfalls in fueling optimal growth rates and also looking at the bright side of it being, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a catalyst to promote uh, the flows of in trade and investment. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fahad. Um, Mr. Uh, Sifrido Reyes, you're the president of uh, Export and Investment Promotion Agency of El Salvador. Um, El Salvador has actually been a uh, a pearl in Central America in terms of success stories in attracting uh, more investment and promoting more exports from your country. Can you share us, you know, how that has improved the competitiveness of El Salvador and, and what role your organization played in that process? Okay. Um, first of all, I think that in these times of globalization, even small countries uh, can play an um, important role in the global economy and also in international trade. Uh, everything will depend on how government design economic policy. Uh, this economic policy should lead to create a good and very healthy competitive business environment to make an economy more productive, more efficient. Um, in the case of El Salvador, we strongly believe that the government has a critical role in creating that very competitive environment. First of all, creating a strong regulatory framework that gives to the investor confidence, trust, as today in the morning one of the speakers was saying. What the investors are looking across the world is a place that provides confidence, that provides predictability, and that the rules of the game won't change uh, along the time. So that is a critical point that we understand and we try to follow this rule. Secondly, we believe that the institutional framework should be very sound. The institution should play 
a critical role, sustaining a very stable economy, particularly in the macroeconomic factors, and also providing rules for competition. Competition is really important if you want to create a very competitive environment. And absolutely, I agree with the, the idea that the government should lead the improvement of public infrastructures. No foreign direct investment will come to any country without roads, without ports, without airports, without water system, without electricity. So it's a very important role for the government, and we truly believe in that. At this moment, we have one of the finest infrastructure system in the whole Latin American region. And it's not the government what it says that, it's the World Economic Forum. So we've been working for decades to create such an infrastructure at a high level that provides all the conditions for local and uh, international firms. And then, of course, a critical role for government is to upgrade the skills of the labor force, providing a high level education to its population. So that is very important. At this moment, many firms across the world are not looking for cheap labor. The most competitive firms are looking for highly trained labor that are able to manage very sophisticated equipment and technologies. So from our point of view, education, and particularly that education that provides skills to high-tech labor is a very important role to, for the government to play. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. May I just ans uh, ask another question to, 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 to the panelists, and please raise your hand if you would like to answer it. We, this point was also raised by Mr. Uh, Mr. Reyes just now, uh, and actually yesterday we had a workshop that was uh, that in which we looked at the competitiveness also of countries and and we used statistics from from FDI markets and actually came up with if you see as some of the most competitive economies year on year out are often countries uh, that have no oil uh, that actually don't have huge consumer markets so it's usually the smaller economies that do not have that component of, let me call it, economic luck that are successful in, in creating a very um, high-ranked business or competitive business environment. How could you explain that? Is, who of the panelists uh, um, can give their insights into that? Maybe I can yes. say something. Actually, you told about the great uh, formula because, you know, having, uh, you know, the, that kind of... Uh, Motivate, motivate, uh, you know, the push is important because when if you are not a surplus country without having an oil production or something like that, an asset like that, you have to create the value addition in your country by a different source. You know, the actually the country that the, the, the city we are living in here, we are uh, making this uh, panel is a great example of that. For many developing economies, actually, it's more or less the you know the, the uh, same situation. Of course, the size of the country and the, uh, how can I say the experience of the bureaucracy is also an important measure because, you know, uh, again from Turkish case, I can say that the oil dependency of the country, the current account deficit, as a challenging issue, is actually making uh, the government pushing government to be more and more active in improving the investment environment to attract more FDI, because FDI is kind of an uh, inevitable uh, case for Turkish economy. I remember the establishment of this agency in 2006 as a part of the whole reform program to improve the investment environment. At that time, I remember that there has been some criticism, especially by the opposition parties at that time. But now, when we look at the opposition parties even, we can see the people, member of parliaments with PhDs on FDI. So everybody accepted the need for the foreign direct investments in the country and the awareness is created somehow because everybody knows that for the economic model of Turkey and the needs of Turkey, it is some kind of inevitable. But when you look at the, you know, the incentive situation, the changing, making the necessary changes in the improvements in the bureaucracy, in the speed that the investment environment requires, of course, uh, the com com country scale is very important. For example, I remember a very important investment last year 
won by an Eastern European economy, uh, again, uh, relatively a sl small one. But to get these investments, uh, and, and everybody in this sector knows that, you know, and knows this story, uh, the prime minister of that country uh, visited the company, you know, the representatives in their hotel. In one night or something like that, they passed all the necessary laws from the, you know, the parliament, and they created a great, you know, the incentive scheme for this, especially company for this investment. So in a, you know, the uh, scale of economy like that, it's something doable, baby. But for countries which are having a, a great experience of bureaucracy, which can be sometimes helpful, sometimes not very helpful, because I usually use the metaphor, the bureaucrats are very interesting. They have a huge experience. Uh, sometimes they want, to, if they want to do something, they have, they know uh, one million ways to do it. But if they don't want to do something, they can create two million ways to not to do it. So it's not an easy issue, especially for IPAs uh, all over the world. It's a very tough job to deal with bureaucracy, frankly speaking, because when we are dealing with bureaucracy, we are sitting in the side of uh, together with the investors against bureaucracy. So it's like, you know, so we are not very popular among bureaucracy, as you can imagine, too. So in that kind of an environment, we are trying to make it easier for the investors. Uh, this is why the, the formula you told about, you know, the having a, a, in a, the, the optimum scale, at the same time maybe having not the, the disadvantage of not having a, uh, you know, the, that kind of a surplus uh, source, is sometimes can be uh, pushing, uh, you know, motivation for uh, having an improvement of the investment environment. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Professor Xavier, um, a question to you. Um, then when countries have done everything to improve the business environment, then sort of your organization is, uh, measures the comparativeness of many countries and provides a sort of a credit rating for countries in terms of how competitive they are. Um, are the existing reports that we sort of use to assess competitiveness, are they sufficient or are they, are they being improved? Um, <coughs> yes. As I, as I uh, mentioned in my first, uh, my first intervention, I, yes, uh, I think that we are not measuring uh, things correctly because the world is evolving. And uh, when the world evolves, uh, you need to evolve with the world uh, to, to uh, capture the new, the new phenomena. Um, and uh, now there are new phenomena, especially in the areas of uh, innovation, as I mentioned, and in the areas of uh, education um, um, related to, uh, to, uh, uh, to innovation. Right, education related to innovation. So let me let me let me uh, mention a few of, of, of some of the things that I, I, I think we we need uh, to 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 measure. Um, no, I, I mentioned the the case, the case of uh, Nokia and uh, Kodak as two examples of uh, companies that died that were leaders, supreme, you know, the best uh, in their fields, the best in the in their uh, sectors. Uh, even today, you know, eight of the most sold uh, phones in the history of the world, eight of the top ten are still Nokia. Uh, but as you know, Nokia went bankrupt, uh, even though uh, they uh, did tons and tons of research. Uh, the problem was that Nokia did not embrace innovation. And there is a big difference between doing R&D and e embracing innovation. Let me give you an, an example of a company that embraced innovation. Uh, you know, do you know when Nespresso was invented? The Nespresso, the machine, the capsules were invented in 1975. They seem to be new, right? Every, is it like a new thing? It's not. It's 1975. Uh, some worker, a worker at, uh, at Nestlé invented, uh, invented the, the technology. Um, now, immediately it was hidden by the CEO and the, uh, the uh, high executives of the company uh, precisely because it was killing the core business. The core business of, uh, of Nestlé at the time was uh, Nescafe, right? If we introduce this new coffee, we're going to kill the old business. We leave off Nescafe, just kill it. And they killed it for many years until the CEO thought that was a good idea, decided to protect the idea from the company, from the executives of the company, and created a separate company, 
right? Nespresso is a separate company. The capital is owned by uh, Nestle, but it was uh, it was completely separate. So the vice president and the the, 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 the high executives couldn't do anything about N Nespresso. And the Nespresso uh, then uh, flourished. It became uh, the superstar uh, business. Now they're making six billion dollars a year. Uh, because um, you know the, the example, the, the, the example here is that they protected, they protected innovation from the company itself. They embraced innovation because the enemy of innovation sometimes is within within the company. Okay. Um, another 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 thing that some of the other things that we need to capture. Pe people people here were, were discussing. We need. We're mentioning that we need predictability of rules. We need transparency. We need uh, to avoid policy reversals, right? So if a country is very unstable or politically unstable or uh, 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 uncertainty in the political process or uncertainty in the regulatory process, uh, we're not going to go to that country. Now, the question is, why are some countries unstable? Why is, wh where does the unpredictability come from? Well, usually, uh, these policy reversals come from lobbies, from pressure groups within the country. Okay? Uh, and these pressure groups arise when uh, companies don't do their job. In other words, companies, at the end of the day, they might end up being responsible for the backlash that hurts companies. Let me go back to the inclusion. Right? We live in a world in which many people gain from technological progress, from the fourth industrial revolution, from globalization, all of this is true, but many people are left behind. Now those people that are left behind, obviously they're gonna fight. They're gonna fight by voting crazy options, by supporting crazy policies, by supporting crazy lobbyists. And then when these lobbies or these policies or these politicians win, then they change the rules. We are, we are seeing this in the largest, in the most powerful country in the world. Changes in the rules as a result of businesses not doing their job, right? Uh, they left people behind. Now, I know that the number one priority of a company should be to make money, but they should be smart because if they make money and there are people left behind, this is going to backlash, the, ch the rules are going to change, policies will become unstable, we're going to elect crazy politicians, uh, and the profits for the companies will go down. Okay? So these are the kinds of things that we need to take into account, things that are going on that, are, that were not taken into account in the past, but we need to take into account not only for us who measure things in the economy. It, this is not about measuring only. This is about thinking, you know, seriously about our, uh, you know, the way we do things, because the way we do things are not here to stay forever. Things might change, and there are reasons why things change. And if we don't take into account these reasons, you know, profits will disappear, and nobody's going to know exactly why. Thank you. That's a, that's a very interesting view. And, and in terms of. So what you're saying, the more stable, the more predictable a business environment is, it can also be a backlash in, in terms of increasing the competitiveness of countries. But how do you sort of, if I summarize it very quickly, but how do you find that balance as a country to at least you know, keep innovating? Like most of the, you're, you're talking about many of the companies that need to keep um, innovating in new products, in new technologies. How do you make that analogy for countries to keep being innovative enough in terms of changing its business environment and at the same time communicating to potential investors that your business environment is very stable or your regulatory business environment is very stable and predictable. Can, can one of the panelists you know, give, yes, Mr. Fahad, please. I, I, think, I think, I think when, when governments uh, look at the uh, 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 competitiveness factors and the way that they should uh, innovate solutions to improve the flows of investment and trade into and out of the country. Uh, uh, I think becoming ahead of the game is a crucial and key success factor by uh, understanding the needs of the business community, by getting close to this, uh, the, the schools of thought that they come from, to the ideas that they uh, promote to the government. Uh, there have been uh, uh, many initiatives and many platforms that 
the government of the UAE through its various instruments reaches out to the business community. We reach out to the investors to understand what the challenges are in terms of policies, in terms of laws and regulations, and in terms of also enablers of the economic diplomacy. How could we serve them better? How could we innovate the services provided to the uh, uh, businesses, not only the businesses originating from the UAE, but also the businesses who wish to come to the UAE. We we have, uh, 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 the, for example, an example, a bigger, a big example of that is the uh, free zones, the number of free zones that we have in the UAE to serve as a hub for these companies to uh, establish themselves in the region and to grow, to have an access to uh, uh, more than I think three or four billion within Asia and Africa. So I think, uh, uh, again, innovation is the answer. Innovation in the services, innovation in uh, addressing the uh, needs of the business community is the key success fact factor for becoming competitive in uh, providing the right services to the investors. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fahad. So it's interesting you mentioned free zones. Um, as we were also going to talk a bit about free zones and incentives, and in fact there is a panel tomorrow specifically dedicated to incentives. Um, but doesn't sort of free zones and incentives uh, countries give to companies, doesn't it make them sort of more or less lazy in terms of being innovative, in terms of the, uh, in, in, uh, increasing the competitiveness of the business environment? Mr. Uh, Mr. Jorge, um, your company invests in many countries in, with different activities. To what extent you know, do you really look at incentives or more from a broader perspective, free zones as a vehicle um, to increase the competitiveness of countries? Does it really make a, different, uh, a difference? When we decided to invest in a, in a country, this is not the first thing that we look for. Uh, the first thing that we look for is stability, predictability. And, uh, and to develop the really a relationship of trust with the government. So this is the most important thing that we look for. But of course, incentives are really important. Uh, you cannot invest alone in innovation because it's a huge investment and it's risky. So many countries uh, give some incentives for innovation investments and we believe this is uh, definitely uh, really important also. But it's not the most important thing for us to choose the country to invest. And even more when we talk about uh, technological innovation. If you take uh, um, as an example a technology intensive uh, sector as aviation sector, um, you take more or less 15 years to, to have a technology be mature enough to be used in a product. And uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, it's very difficult for one company to do investment in all the technologies he needs, it needs and for all those years without having some incentives. And uh, most of the many technologies will fall in what we call the, the valley of death in the middle of this road because of lack of incentives for that. So it's, it's really important. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Jorge. Um, Dr. Samir, uh, you, your organization represents many, many free zones. How can free zones improve the future um, competitiveness of, of countries? What role can they play in enhancing that or shaping that in terms of the, the future? Do you recognize some of the points that the panelists have mentioned and how can, can free zones solve some of those challenges? Thank you, Douglas. As I said in my few words of introduction, we are the unique voice of these 4,000 free zones. We are permanently in touch with all the stakeholders, government, multinational corporation, companies, civil society, in order to see 
how through us, through these zones, we improve the competitiveness of the country. And we have been asked lots of questions. We have been consulted in lots of points. If you allow me, I can somehow summarize all these questions and all these points related to through free zones, improving the national competitiveness, and I can summarize them in three points. The first point is, what is the major immediate challenge for zones? The second point, and here I comment to my colleague Jorge, what is beyond incentives? In some country, I just came back from Poland. Poland, 20 years ago, was a textile company. The textile company, let's say, disappeared 20% of unemployment. Today, Poland is an economic miracle. Less than 5% unemployment and a totally diversified economy. But they have a major challenge. The incentives they have been using to attract investors has a deadline, 2022. This is also the same situation in the 53 African countries, which has been allowed by the United Nations, by the multilateral organization, to use incentives to attract investors. These incentives has a deadline, 2025. For you and me, 2025 is far away. Nice. For a country, it's tomorrow. So what is beyond incentives? The third big block of questions we have been asked is, at the end of the day, this foreign direct investment, these incentives we give are, in a certain how, less tax collection for the country. What is in the society, in the long term, from this foreign direct investment? The answer of these three questions, what is the major immediate challenges, these are quality of the service. Zones should be the best place to do business in each country. The second answer, what is beyond incentives? Innovation. And the third question, or the third answer, what is in the society from this foreign direct investment? We say sustainability. So this is why um, His Highness in our last, our last event in May, in 2016, we launched a global initiative called the Free Zone of the Future. And the Free Zone of the Future program is divided in three pillars, best in class, quality of the service, innovation, and sustainability. For continue being the best in class in quality of services, the executive of zones the person responsible for attracting foreign direct investment should update their skill. We cannot today manage a free zone. We cannot manage a national agency to attract investors with the skills we had in the university 30 years ago. There is a need of an executive education. There is a need, and the second point, of standardization, quality of the service, and there is a need for all of us to be tech ready. This is under best in class quality of the service. When it comes to innovation, I would like to share with you a small experience. Before joining this organization, I contributed and supported a free zone based in Dubai called the Dubai Silicon Oasis. We have 1,000 company. We went to the three biggest company, three multinational. And with these three multinational and us as a free zone, we created a small fund just $1,100 between the three multinationals and us. With this small fund, we incubated 50 young talent in 2013. 2014, the multinational had 20 small and medium enterprises working from them, and we announced it as Dubai Silicon Oasis 20 new companies. So, innovation, all the zones we are planning to have entrepreneurship initiative and creating incubation centers. Again, under innovation, don't forget 
90% of the company, they are under the zones, or 90% of the FDI are small and medium enterprises. This is the real engine of competitiveness. Sustainability, environment. We cannot continue today attracting investors without taking care about environment. Second, when you speak about investment, we always speak about investors and the government, investors and the authority. We always forget the main pillar, the worker. We have to be as zones in order to improve our competitiveness, the best place to work and the best place for skills. With these three major elements, quality of the service, innovation, and sustainability, we launched last May a global initiative for called the Free Zone of the Future. We at Zones, we think that economic development is not enough for a country. We need to look for prosperity. Economic development, you create a wealth. Prosperity, the wealth, you share it between the investors and the society. This is why, just for your knowledge, this program is called Izdihar. Izdihar in Arabic means prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Samir. Given the, uh, the time that we have left, I would like to give the floor also, the audience also, the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions to the distinguished panel. And afterwards, I would like to ask each panelist to wrap up and give a few key messages that they would like to convey to the audience. I apologize. I come from a country speaking French. I would like to speak in French. Je m'appelle Madame Jao Fatukine. Je suis la présidente. I speak English or French? Go ahead with French. Go ahead with French. French. Yes, I think French. most Je of the panelists speak French. I speak a little French, so uh, I will be able to translate it. Alors, je suis la présidente de l'Organisation des Femmes d'Affaires Africaines. Vous avez posé le problème de l'emploi des jeunes. Vous avez posé le problème de l'innovation. Nous, notre innovation, en ce qui concerne le retour de nos enfants qui sont allés en émigration clandestine. Nous voulons que ces enfants retournent en Afrique pour participer à la croissance en Afrique. Pour ce faire, nous avons initié un programme de réalisation de ce que nous appelons des villages verts en Afrique. C'est dans le cadre de la création de richesses en Afrique, c'est dans le cadre également de la promotion du développement durable. Dans nos villages, nous avons prévu des logements sociaux pour les jeunes. Nous avons prévu également de donner à chaque acteur un domaine agricole ou bien un bâtiment d'élevage ou un bâtiment d'aviculture ou de ferme aquacole. Donc, nous sommes là pour chercher des investisseurs. Tout à l'heure aussi, monsieur qui représente la zone franche, vous avez dit que vous aviez créé un fonds pour développer votre zone. Et nous, pour accompagner ces villages verts, pour accompagner le financement, nous avons créé un fonds d'investissement et de financement privé pour la participation du secteur privé africain dans le financement. Là aussi, nous cherchons des investisseurs qui pourront nous aider à mettre en place ce fonds et à le développer pour développer l'Afrique par les Africains et avec vous, les investisseurs. Je vous remercie. Dr. Samir, would you like to, this is also about free zones in, in Africa, yes. would you like? Uh, thank you for your question. Just uh, at the beginning, I will translate uh, our colleague question. She was, uh, she's the president of African business women and uh, one of their major project, it is how to attract back their uh, bracket kids that immigrate abroad and uh, to involve them in, uh, in some local sustainable development. Um, perhaps within the presentation I have done uh, about the free zone of the future, I miss it one element when it comes to sustainability. Uh, I said sustainability is based on environment and a good place to work for local, for people. The third pillar of this sustainability is a corporate social responsibility. Within our program, the Free Zone of the Future, 
we are pushing each one and every person of our membership to develop a corporate social responsibility program in order to involve the foreign direct investors with the local society. And the idea came, I was in, 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 in Accra, Ghana, and they have uh, an agricultural product. This product is transformed in oil, and the oil is exported for cosmetic multinationals, European one. The problem that five producers accumulate 20% more, five producers accumulate the three quarter of the production. So we made a corporate social program to have at least, at least 20% of the production bought from small. Yeah, thanks Douglas. Uh, congratulations for the panel and for the insights. Uh, my question regards the issue of dialogue between government and multinational corporations. Uh, how can we improve that? How we can really spur dialogue? Uh, yet uh, co corporations, they uh, move on a different pace that government does. And even uh, the understanding, the capability of governments to understand the issues that affect multinationals are sometimes limited, even when they have investment promotion agencies. Uh, by the way, I'm the CEO of uh, Paraná Brazil Investment Agency, and uh, this issue of dialogue we see across countries, across uh, different levels, state and federal level. So the question will be, how can uh, the dialogue between government and multinationals be improved? Any insights? Thank you for the question. Any of the panelists that would like to volunteer in addressing this question? I, could, okay. I, I think there is, um, it depends a lot on each government for sure. And it depends a lot of the speed the government can and the flexibility it has in order to adapt to the new reality. But I think that one, one way to do that is to have a sort of forum or to, to use the agencies that many, many of those, these governments have and to discuss what are the, the, the improvements that they, they may uh, do uh, in order to, to keep the, a good uh, environment for business. So this, um, there, there are many governments, many different countries that do that and we, we are experiencing this this type of relationship with many different governments, and this works very well. But of course, it, it is still depending on the, the, the speed of change that they can do sometimes. And uh, we need, uh, in a different pace, these changes. And depending on the, the, the legal framework, it's not possible to do in that speed we, we need. So, but we discuss also this. And sometimes uh, we also have some involvement in the, um, uh, the proposals of a new legal framework uh, and something like that. So there, this type of relationship is really important. That's why in the beginning I, I, I told that one of the most important things is a, a real partnership uh, between the government. I'd like to, uh, sorry. Uh, I just would like to uh, to add a couple of points, and I totally agree uh, with my colleague in, in, in the way he, he formulated his answer. Uh, I think when, when looking at the uh, uh, the question that you've, you've just mentioned from the perspective of the UAE, we have established uh, several effective channels for multinational companies or NMC, um, MNCs to uh, start a dialogue with the government on the federal and on the local uh, government's level. Uh, at the moment we have uh, intergovernmental uh, joint committees that are uh, spearheaded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where they have an economic dimension uh, and that economic dimension is the right channel for uh, discussions to be started to be also continued with the government on certain issues of mutual interest. Uh, there are also other channels from the uh, uh, local entities or the local states in, in the UAE, the local governments in the UAE, uh, especially that uh, several ones of them have their own investment promotion or, or investment attraction agency. Uh, I don't want to take long in my answer, but uh, uh, this is a to-be-continued discussion, of course. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Reyes. 
you also wanted to add? Yes, yes please um, go ahead. I think that this dialogue between the government and the please, private sector. Please speak closer to the microphone, please. Um, I, I think this dialogue between the governments and the private sector, including the multinational firms, should be done on a regular basis. Because um, every firm, domestic, either domestic or international, should depend on the condition that the government provides to make profits. And the governments depend on the firms to create jobs to improve the condition of, of the whole population. In the case of my country, I can provide some examples. Um, we have a serious problem with custom. Custom is old fashioned. Custom is a serious problem for international trade. So we decided to establish a joint commission with the private sector in order to establish where are the problems, where are the causes of this failed system of custom. And then we decide to transform the whole system in order to improve the conditions and the efficiency of international trade. Uh, we also created a commission to um, identify the bureaucracy and the problems that bureaucracy puts on doing business. That's a real problem in the most of the countries in Latin America. The waste of money, the waste of time, the time that takes to create a business, to launch a business, a new project. In some countries, it comes to two to three years. In the case of my country, you got to get at least 10 government permits. So we decided to create a joint commission in order to have the point of view of the private sector, including the transnational firms, and also from the government. I think that there's no serious solution to any of these problems of competitiveness without a serious and mutual respect dialogue between the private and the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Emut, please. I think it's a very important question for the reason of existence of the investment promotion agencies because First of all, I think the managing the communication between the two sides is very important. Because uh, you know, when it turns into a kind of a game, everybody's trying to do something, then it, tur it turns, it is the, the possibility or risk of uh, being, turn being turned into a kind of a personal PR game. Uh, how can I explain that? For example, if uh, everybody starts to speak about the economy in a country, then it's becoming more and more complicated and difficult for foreign investors to deal with the right authority. And secondly, you know, uh, sometimes there's also risk to with the, some good intentions. If you create uh, some different commissions, different bodies to deal with the Im investors, then actually you start to add one by one some new bureaucratic burdens to their, uh, you know, their, on their shoulders is another risk. So leaving, it, leaving this communication the most one or two or two, maybe actually the ideal is the one either an investment promotion agency or a board i don't know but only one authority you know and authorized in an efficient way to deal with the both the, the side of the government and side of the multinational business i think it's very important and both sides will not will be knowing that this is the authority authorized for that they are providing the communication between the two because in otherwise you know, you can see the situations where an investor, for example, in energy sector, is being, uh, you know, having a, uh, you know, the uh, how can I say, uh, rendezvous with the Minister of Agriculture at first, just for the sake of showing, for example, if there's a consultancy company between the two, to show, that, okay, I have a great network in this country, but actually it's not the way. You are making the investor losing time and efficiency, and actually you are making the investment environment worse in, in, a, in a nutshell. So this is why I think the investment promotion agencies can be a great banner, you know, the, uh, tool for that. If we can make these uh, institutions more efficient in the bureaucracy, bureaucracy and we can, if we can position these agencies in a better way, then they can really play a good role and actually the role that must play in a better way. In otherwise, everybody starts to work uh, and everybody starts to speak in the name of government, in the name of the industries, 
who wants to make a, you know, the benefit out of it the next time, maybe he wants to be a member of parliament, anything. <laughs> but at the end, it turns into a mess and it becomes uh, unmanageable. Thank you. Thank you. We have room for one more question. So, yes, sir, at the back. Yeah, my, my name is Yusuf. I am from Oman. So my, my question will be in, in Omani language. Is it okay? That's fine. That's fine. No <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Fahad al -Gurir. You know, the, nobody deny Dubai successful in attracting FDI and really, I mean, massive uh, uh, inflow uh, of FDI coming to Dubai. What's the main ingredients or the successful component uh, that make Dubai so much attractive? Number one. Number two, some of the panelists talking about the new, new set of skills required for promotion agency to be, to be unable to, to attract and uh, uh, attract FDI. Thanks. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the first question, uh, a simple answer would be uh, visionary leadership, uh, which have translated this vision into competent uh, uh, legislations, strong and state-of-the-art infrastructure, uh, provided the uh, right level of incentives to provide a uh, high level of confidence to the investors to come to the UAE and especially to Dubai uh, 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 and not also to, uh, uh, to forget the connectivity that uh, uh, has been uh, a clear investment uh, I would say endeavor that Dubai has taken has taken sen uh, since a very long time ago and has reached to a very high level at the moment to, uh, for, for Dubai to become the hub in the uh, Middle East for trade and investment. Uh, I think this would uh, uh, be the answer of the first question uh, to, uh, that he, he has ans answered. Maybe the second question could be to the panelists just to not monopolize the discussion. I would like, like to, because we're, I'm already getting some information that we need to close the panel, but I would like to give every panelist the floor to you know, close the session off, maybe take into account some of the questions that were asked, but maybe also give a key message to all the people here that are uh, improving their business environment and trying to increase the competitiveness of their countries. I would like to start at the end. Uh, Dr. Prof Professor Xavier, maybe you would like to give a few key messages and, and well <clears throat> let me let me let me give uh, one message that uh, probably contradicts everything i said before and that is uh, we should not underestimate our ignorance uh, many of the things <clears throat> that we recommend uh, we don't really know uh, economists don't know, uh, academics don't know, uh, governments don't know, consultants don't know, investment agencies don't know. The world is a very, very complicated place. <clears throat> Econ the eco e the economics is the science of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, decision making uh, you know, in response to incentives. But many, many, many times incentives are very complicated and we don't really know how people are going to react. And if you get, allow me to give me a personal example, um, I, have a, I have a young daughter uh, who at age two was about to be trained in a, um, you know, doing her PP in the potty, uh, potty training. Uh, and she was not uh, able to do that. Uh, uh, my wife uh, didn't know how to do it. So I, an economist, I said, I know how incentives work. I'm gonna solve the problem. Uh, and I told my daughter, if you do your PP in the potty, I'll give you a bag of M&Ms. Uh, in, uh, in 20 minutes, uh, she did her PP in the potty, and I proclaimed the success of economic science until uh, the following morning. Uh, my daughter called me and said, Papa, I have to do PP. Uh, can you take me to the potty? And then she went to the potty and did a little bit of PP, and she asked for a bag of M&Ms. Two minutes later, she says, Papi, I have to go to the potty again. And uh, she did another PP, another bag of M&Ms. So, so a two-year-old girl learned how to divide her PP into 20 different pieces to get 20 bags of M&Ms, okay? Uh, and 
you know, I am an economist, I'm a professor at Columbia University, I thought that I understood incentives until my daughter told me, taught me a very important lesson. I didn't really understand. Thank you, that's a very good example of how you learn the real life of economics, actually. <laughs> So it's uh, actually the big lesson is listen to your children and they that's tell how, you that, how it is. But that, that's how <laughs> subsidies work too. <laughs> Thank you for that. The, uh, Mr. Reyes, please. Yes. Um, 11 years ago was created this competitive index by the World Economic Forum. And probably this index was focused on the role that the governments play to create a very competitive business environment. So uh, today, I think we have to have a new approach to competitiveness. And we have also to include such concepts as social inclusion, as Professor Salai Martin was mentioning, and how companies are complying with the labor rights, how firms are complying with the environmental standards, how companies are contributing to fiscal sustainability of the economies. Uh, so I think that this is uh, the occasion to rethink about how we measure competitiveness. Because as it was today mentioned, from time to time we see, we observe countries that suddenly fail, that suddenly go in reverse, because we were paying attention only in the traditional, in the classic factor of competitiveness. And we were forgetting about other important, critical uh, uh, factors, such as the social and the environmental factor that provide the whole uh, environment for business. Business is not only the role of firms, and it's not, not only the role of government. It's the whole role of the economic and social groups in a whole society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Samir. Uh, thank you. Let me use also some humor like Xavier. Xavier and I, we come and we work together in the same city, Barcelona. And uh, I think everybody agree that we have the best football team. There is no discussion about it. I don't know whether that's okay. uh, a good so, statement here at the panel. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and uh, one of the things that this team implemented, independently from where it comes, they based their innovation in football, and they won whatever they won, based on two elements, short distance. So whatever you have to do with investors should be based on short distance and permanent dialogue. The second point, the players know by heart where are their colleagues. So there is a need of anticipation. A lot of being changing now in the world economy, a lot of being changing in the competitiveness, and we have to anticipate their need. Short distance and anticipation, I think it is the future of competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samir. I think that's an uh, interesting analogy to look at the way football is being played in terms of how, what we can learn for increasing our competitiveness. Uh, please, Mr. Jorge. I think that um, for an, a company to be competitive, of course, it depends a lot on the, um, the competitiveness of the country regarding a very good infrastructure and a very good logistic uh, and uh, uh, um, affordable energy and so on. So this is the ground. But I believe that most important is to have a very uh, robust institutions and uh, predictability is really, really important. This is what um, stimulates the company to invest more in that country because it's a long-term relationship. So everything that it is already in place doesn't mean it's not necessary a guarantee that will be lasting for the next years. So this is, for me, the most important thing. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Jorge. I think uh, from, from uh, my perspective, looking at the uh, uh, recommendations at the end of the session, 
uh, although the traditional uh, stimuli for economic growth, such as the fiscal and, and monetary policies or monetary invest in, in incentives, uh, I would recommend that policymakers look at the unconventional stimuli uh, which are uh, uh, spurring from the competitiveness uh, dimension. Uh, looking at, uh, for example, structural competitiveness reform as a solution to, to increase the flows of trade and investment. Uh, on, on another uh, uh, issue, I would also recommend that we explore more the relationship between uh, competitiveness and uh, uh, foreign direct investment, either positive or negative effect of competitiveness uh, on it. Uh, future anticipation is key, uh, being agile, uh, uh, having, as my colleague mentioned, robust institutions that could cater for the changes in the uh, economic outlook in the future, given that uh, sluggish economic uh, forecasts have been uh, seen through many institutions. I would imagine that this would be uh, uh, a proper way to look forward uh, out of this session uh, as a recommendation from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, I want to, if uh, any government officials are listening here, I mean, not only for Dubai, for the whole governments, first of all, please go easy on the investment promotion agencies. Definitely, these guys are competing in a, an environment which is getting more and more difficult in the world, you know, uh, with increasing uh, protectionist rhetoric, increasing racism and nationalism, in especially in Europe, in West, in general, in politics and in economics, too. And uh, now, the, thanks to that, the global trade is on, uh, on the edge, and the, 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 uh, unfortunately, the global FTI is expected to shrink at least something like 15% according to the estimations of the bodies like ANCTAD. So it's becoming more and more difficult to get a fair share from this shrinking cage, actually, a global cage. And not only the developing countries, but now the developed countries are also trying to become more and more active in industries. For example, you can, as an investor, you can easily get, get a call from one of the states uh, and governorships of even from United States with a proactive, uh, you know, the stance to get you to their uh, constituency. Of course, if you want to go there, if you want to come from Dubai or Istanbul, you cannot take your laptops and, and uh, you know, the iPads to the board, thanks to Mr. Trump now. So you now that the, you can see how protectionism can to, uh, come to a point. I'm also a board member in a low-cost carrier. It's a joint venture between Lufthansa and Turkish Airlines. Uh, it's a co company called Sun Express. Actually, this company itself is a good example how a toughly competing rivals can get together when it comes to you know the compete in a different uh, area, which is rising very fastly, the low-cost level. But it's also showing that whatever you do in a professional way, if the governments are not, not uh, you know, the cooperative and, and thinking about some um, uh, not, uh, not far-sighted uh, visions, then it can be very difficult for everybody to compete in that kind of an environment. But in that uh, whole picture, I think investment promotion agencies can play an inter a very instrumental and functional role to increase competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, uh, to close this session. A few remarks and I think some of the key messages the, the panelists gave us in the, uh, in the final remarks they gave. One of them is, you know, go easy on the investment promotion agencies, cherish them, because they are a, the intermediaries between the government and, and, and companies is an important one. And teamwork and being agile is also, uh, is, is, and being flexible in terms of shaping your policy, policies to be more competitive. Um, I think also what was mentioned that it's a long-term relationship. So managing long-term relationships between an investor and a country is something that is that should be nurtured and should be more cherished. Um, the final two lessons in terms of improving your competitiveness, uh, two lessons that I personally did not see coming is uh, listen to your children and watch FC Barcelona. So so there's, I'd like to close off with those two. Uh, Two remarks. I would really like to thank the audience for their contribution, but above all, also the uh, the experts here on stage that did a great job in uh, managing this panel. So thank you very much. <laughs>